This man is so generous. <laughs> right, well, the greatest biological diversity on our planet, terrestrial and marine, is in the islands of Indonesia. In the years that I've worked there, more than half of the lowland tropical forests have been destroyed, and the coral reefs, which used to be pristine around the island of Bali, are now blanketed with the fleshy algae which kills them. And Balinese would like a word. <laughs> so, in May of 2009, they flew an airplane with temple priests and farmers and officials and dancers, and they performed a ritual at UNESCO Paris called a, a nyomian. It's designed, it's a pradana ritual. It's designed to make things grow and be transformed. UNESCO had no idea what to do with this, and this, as with the previous four attempts to create a UNESCO World Heritage in Bali, failed. But we tried again. I became involved at that point, and uh, as Andrew just said, in June, UNESCO said yes. So we now have a World Heritage cultural landscape in Bali, and that's the good news. But the UNESCO delegate who came to the dedication ceremonies in Bali warned that with more than a million visitors a year in Bali, they're on the brink. In other words, something has to happen fast to make this world heritage actually work. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. So elsewhere in Asia, there are lots of world heritage sites. There's sort of three kinds. There are parks. There are things that UNESCO calls dead monuments. And there are cultural landscapes. So even the ones that UNESCO calls a dead monument, like Angkor, are in trouble. In Bali, they have monuments, okay? Beautiful monuments, like Angkor, that also is true. But unlike Angkor Wat, in Bali, the system is still alive, at least for now. So the goal of this World Heritage Project in Bali is to keep it alive. And to do that, it turns out we need to explain it to the world. So it needs to become comprehensible. And at the same time, we would like to have the UNESCO designation work to actually empower the people who live within the World Heritage Sites. And these are, by and large, poor villagers in 21 villages up in the mountains of Bali. So you may ask, what are they trying to save, and why should we care about something happening on a little island on the other side of the planet? 75, 76. The Green Revolution had just begun. The Green Revolution means the <clears throat> introduction of Western farming techniques, basically. It's high-yielding plants that are designed to grow quickly, along with chemical fertilizers and pesticides. So this came as a package to the Balinese farmers. The farmers were told, in the interests of national development, take this new rice and plant just as fast as you can. If you can get three crops a year, great. Some of the old people said, well, the trouble with that is, According to our traditional system, we, we schedule, you know, we carefully time when the water goes into the fields and when it doesn't. And it has their reasons for that. After a couple of years of bumper harvest, those reasons started to become clear. Stephen Lansing's old friend, Wayan Pege, is a farmer in Sebatu. He remembers what it was like 20 years ago when the pests began to appear. The Green Revolution remedy for pests was pesticides. It's not just that the farmers were advised to use pesticides. They were forced to use pesticides. They would, they would be punished by the government if they didn't, because the government would say, if anybody doesn't use pesticides immediately, as soon as any sign of pests appear, then the pest will spread to other fields. So within a year or two, even the farmers you know, pumping these pesticides into their fields couldn't kill all the pests. The government then began to fly the island dropping pesticides from airplanes, and they succeeded in killing damn near everything. He says that everything is made by a creator, and so uh, by disturbing anything, by killing anything, you're, you're disturbing part of the creation, so you need to pay attention to the whole picture. Essentially, he's saying you have to pay attention to the whole picture. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And that, Stephen told me, was the role of the water temple. Looking at the whole picture, applying wisdom accumulated over centuries. In the middle courtyard of the temple, 
The farmers gather every month. They make decisions in a democratic assembly on how they're going to plant. So these organizations that manage the water are called Subox. And there are inscriptions from the 11th century that talk about Subox. They are democratic organizations. They do it collectively. And some of them have been, have been working, actually, for, for that long. So it's an ancient system of democratic control from the bottom up. We don't know of many like it in anthropology. And it turns out that as these Subox interact through the water temple networks, they achieve a global optimum, meaning that everybody gets an optimal rice harvest. And we'll talk about why that happens this afternoon in, a, in another session. So it's a great story, but uh, now the Subox are losing about 1,000 hectares of rice terraces per year, and the Subox have lost control. So the World Heritage was a, a gamble, an attempt to create a cultural landscape that could, um, that could help solve that problem. But the problem is that World Heritage cultural landscapes seldom actually benefit the people who live in them, and Bali's World Heritage is a sacred landscape. So the World Heritage will bring visitors. The Balinese have a million or so a year, so there are plenty of visitors already, and it can bring visitors to these villagers in the mountains. But how to include the villagers, excuse me, the visitors without causing harm? So as we were trying to find a solution to that problem, I was contacted by a friend in Singapore who told me that she wanted to introduce an Australian landscape architect who just finished at Harvard and had a project, and she was going around the world pursuing her passion to study sacred landscapes. So she sent us materials like this. She just finished a project in Tibet, looking at the landscape and the meaning of Mount Kailash. So I was then in Bali. We were working this through. We looked at this, my Balinese friends and I, and said, Sapriti diatur, which means as if meant to be. So we said, yes, Julia Watson, we would be very glad if you'd come and have a look at the sacred landscape in Bali. And by the way, uh, if you're willing, we could use your skills. My name is Julia Watson, and I'm a professor here at RPI, where I'm teaching a design studio where the students are looking at designing for the new World Heritage Landscape in Bali. The key problem for the villagers is how to cope with the foreign visitors. And with over a million visitors to Bali each year, the landscape is literally in danger of being loved to death. We want to bring some design concepts directly to the 21 villages inside the UNESCO World Heritage Landscape. What would the Balinese people like to share with their visitors? We're creating designs for lots of projects like visitor gateways, museums and interpretive walks. We want to give control back to the villages of the design process. Please welcome Julia. <laughs> For the past few months, Steve Lansing and I, accompanied by a team of landscape architects and a dedicated group of young architects at RPI, have been trying to figure out how to design a proposal that interprets the Trihita Karana philosophy. The Trihita Karana is a philosophy of the Balinese, which is about the interconnectedness of the spirit of the human and of the earth. The Balinese people believe that the guardian temples around Bali, the landscape of Bali, protect the lakes, forests, rice terraces, and the 21 villages that lie within the World Heritage Area. So what we've been looking at in the design proposal is how do you integrate sacred cosmological systems that are ancient into contemporary design proposals. One of these systems that we've been looking at is the Nawasanga. It is translated as the four directions. And it's about this idea that there's a sacred relationship to the volcanoes and a profane relationship to the sea. This is called the Kaja and the Kelad. There's also associations with eight wind directions, colors, sounds, and emotions. This picture also shows you that there's a relationship that the Balinese believe that your internal world is the same as the external world around you. 
One of, the, one of the other concepts that we've been looking at in the design proposal is called the Tribuana, also translated as the Three Realms. This is the idea that the island of Bali is divided into a tripartite division, and there's different levels of sacredness associated with different elevations of the island. At the highest elevation of the island is the Swa, middle area in the plains is the Boa, and around the sea is called the Burr. And there are different relationships associated with that in terms of how it should be treated and how sacred it is to the Balinese people. By looking at these different cosmological systems, we've started to understand that sacred relationships in the landscape essentially protect ecosystem processes. So that this Swa area at the top of the island, which is the most sacred area, is actually protecting the volcanic landscape that provides all the nutrients to the Subak system. We've also been looking at ideas of symbiosis between man and nature, which makes this ecosystem the most resilient system and the most biodiverse agroecosystem known to man. It's these relationships between all the different species that are integral to this system that man has harnessed the different cycles of the rice cycle and come to understand how species actually benefit the growth of this rice cycle completely organically. So what are we doing with these uh, investigations and how are we going to propose this design, this design concept? The four sites that have been chosen for the World Heritage Area are actually dispersed throughout the whole island of Bali. So the first idea that we had was that we must connect all these different sites. We've designated two routes that would take tourists from the coastal plains up to the mountains. The reason there are four sites is because these four different sites exemplify different characteristics of the Subak system. So what we're trying to do with the design proposal is also show what these unique characteristics would be. To introduce people to what the World Heritage actually is, we've, we're going to designate existing museums which are underutilized as visitor gateways. These would be the first experiences that tourists have when they engage with this landscape. We're not imagining that these museums would actually be buildings that hold artifacts. What we're imagining is we would actually immerse visitors into the landscape and subvert the idea of a museum as a building that has boundaries and actually extend the boundaries out into the landscape so that people would understand what a Subak system is and how it works ecologically as well as spiritually. So the second part of the design proposal is figuring out how it works spatially throughout the island at the large and small scale. The other part of this is how do we give the people of Bali the voice so that they can actually tell the stories that they want to tell about the landscape that they live in. So the proposal is about enabling communities to inspire these designs and enabling them to control the types of stories that they want to tell. At the moment, we're in the first step of this process. What we're planning is to take an installation, a temporary exhibition, all throughout the island of Bali, starting in Jakarta at the ministry, traveling to the ministry in Bali, and then onto the 21 villages to ask them to tell us what they'd like in Bali, to get feedback and to integrate that into the next phase of the design process. Lastly, as Steve was saying, World heritage is a wonderful thing, but often it uh, displaces the community that has originally lived there. For this World Heritage site, we are very cautious about integrating the community and not displacing them. So we've decided to think up a whole new level of governance to control World Heritage, and we hope that this model be, might be replicable throughout other World Heritage throughout the world. This idea is the Governing Assembly, and this Governing Assembly is a group of Subak farmers that will control the, peop the actual governmental process and will control the revenue that comes in from the visitor gateways. So complete control is given over to the community and not to the ministries. And that's our plan. Thank you very much. Thank you.